Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Stephanie Jeruso. I'm the clinic administrator with Novant Health Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. And today, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming um, Dr. Charles Craven. He is going to be uh, speaking to everybody about the total joint experience here at Novant Health. Um, and we will provide an opportunity at the end of um, his presentation for everyone to ask questions. Um, you can type those in the chat or um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you and um, give you the opportunity to ask those live. Um, so uh, keep those questions for the end if you have those and we'll be happy to answer everyone's question. So uh, everybody welcome Charles Craven. Hi, Stephanie. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, welcome uh, and thanks for joining me for this lunchtime seminar. So um, we'll get right into it. So the title of the seminar is The Total Joint Experience at Novant Health. So I'm Dr. Charles Craven. And so what we're going to do today, just to kind of preview, I'm going to introduce myself to you. Um, I've been with Novant for, for about two years now. I'm going to discuss hip and knee arthritis treatment options and some of the new technologies that we employ here at Novant Health. To, um, for total hip and knee replacement. And finally, I'll brag a little bit about uh, the facility that I have the pleasure and honor of working at, Clemens Medical Center, and tell you a little bit about the total joint experience there. So I hail from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I've put a few photos here. Um, that is when I think of Boston, a beautiful city, four seasons, um, and love that part of the country. I went to medical school in Albany, New York, and this is the memory I'm left with from Albany, um, the snow. <laughs> Um, so I joined the Navy Medical School, frankly, because I didn't have the money to pay for medical school. So I figured, what the heck? I had family that served, and what you know, for most people, starts out as a few-year journey. Uh, for me, ended uh, after 21 years. So I actually served for 21 years in the Navy. The majority of my time was spent in sunny San Diego. So when I think of San Diego, that's sort of the perception I have is the sun and the beautiful weather. I did spend uh, two years in Japan, and um, as they say, join the Navy, see the world. I had the opportunity to visit uh, much of the world during my time. So I just a quick collage here about some of uh, my fondest memories from the Navy. Uh, the picture there riding a camel, that's an incident that happened in the Middle East, which I think is pretty cool. Not every day you get to ride a camel, I guess. Um, the ship that you see there on the uh, mid left part of the screen is a ship that I actually served on for three years. And in the upper right, you see uh, me in a younger, um, less follicularly challenged state. Uh, with one of my uh, sailors on the ship. I uh, served a year in Afghanistan uh, in a camp called Camp Holland. And um, if you ever think you're having a bad day, this gentleman was one of my patients in Afghanistan. And what I remember about him is that in this picture, he's 47 years old. And so people tend to age less gracefully in other countries that have, don't have the resources that the United States does. Um, in the twilight of my career in the Navy, I served uh, three years in Vietnam, I was able to go on humanitarian missions for three consecutive years to the country of Vietnam and do joint replacement uh, surgery with the local surgeons on Vietnamese patients, which was a wonderful experience. And then finally, in um, September 2019, uh, I ended my Navy career, and that is me in my retirement ceremony. The very same day my Navy career ended, my career at Navant began. And I chose uh, this job amongst many jobs. Uh, number one, because of North Carolina, beautiful state, and uh, it was nice to get back to the East Coast. But also, uh, everything that I had hoped would be true about Novant when I joined, uh, two years later, I can tell you, is true. And most importantly, Novant wants me to take good care of you. And quality of care is emphasized, and I have the tools and resources to provide quality, cutting-edge care to my patients. So my values align very much with uh, Novant. And uh, this is a wonderful organization to work for, and I'm very blessed. So we'll talk about arthritis. Um, what is arthritis? Uh, it, arthritis affects 54 million Americans annually. So that's one in five diagnosed annually with arthritis. There are a couple different kinds. Uh, the most common is osteoarthritis. And this is known as degenerative arthritis or wear and tear arthritis. Simply put, the cartilage that coats the end of our bones uh, due to age, genetics, weight can play a, a factor, uh, degenerates. And when the cartilage or cushioning wears out, we have now two bone surfaces and a joint contacting each other, which we're not meant to do that, and that causes pain. Some less common types of arthritis, there's rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually an autoimmune type of disease where the body's uh, immune system fights itself and damages the joints. 
And then, of course, we have post-traumatic arthritis, which may be a situation where there's been a fracture or some other uh, damage to the joint, and over time, the cartilage, because of that uh, in injury, goes on to deteriorate. But the end stage of any type of arthritis, as you see in this cartoon of a hip, <clears throat> is we take uh, normal cartilage, which again is a cushioning and lubricant of the joint, and once that goes away, we have exposed bone, which is very painful. Here's an actual x-ray. On the left, we see a normal hip joint, the bone socket joint, um, has a great space in between it, and that's where the cartilage is. On the right, we see a, a joint that has severe arthritis. You can see there's bone-on-bone -bone contact there. And on both sides of the joint, there are cystic changes, and that's how the bone reacts to not having the cartilage cushion. Same thing in the knee. On the left here in this cartoon, we see the normal white um, elastic-type cartilage in the joint. And on the right side here, we see a knee that is worn out where now there is exposed bone. Here's an x-ray of that. So on the left, a normal knee joint, oops, with good space. And on the right, you can see on the inner part of the knee, on the right side of the x-ray, uh, the knee is bone on bone. And again, the end stage for arthritis is that it hurts. So when I talk about arthritis treatment uh, in the office and meet patients, surgery is actually the last thing on my mind. Uh, I see my job as you know maintaining quality of life. That's what we do when we treat arthritis, and there are a whole host of ways to do that without surgery. So surgery is actually a last resort. A lot of the guidelines that we use as orthopedic surgeons in treating arthritis and other diseases comes to us from our academy. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons governs the practice of uh, orthopedic practice in the United States, and they have made evidence-based guidelines, which basically means a bunch of very intelligent doctors and surgeons have sat down and reviewed all the literature, and they sort of distill out the facts from the myth and help me as the practitioner who's helping patients and seeing patients with arthritis um, sort of separate the wheat from the chaff in what works and, and what doesn't work, okay? So some of the things that we talk about with arthritis, ambulatory aids, such as a cane, crutches, walker, can help you put less weight on an effective joint. Heating cold therapy can help with an achy joint. Physical therapy can absolutely help arthritic uh, joints. And then, of course, the mainstay of arthritis treatment <clears throat> is going to be over-the-counter or prescription, in some cases, anti-inflammatory medication, which is a very powerful pain-relieving pain medication that can take away the inflammation of the arthritis and help with the pain. So as we go through the journey of non-operative management together, some of the things that uh, you know, you'll want to ask yourself, and I'll certainly ask as well, <clears throat> at a certain point, once you've been diagnosed with arthritis and you tried the non-operative management, which includes the things we've talked about, in addition to injections, and there are different types of injections, whether it be cortisone, the gel shot, or the rooster shot, uh, PRP injections, etc. At some point, the symptoms may um, get to a point where the non-operative treatments are not working. And the things we want to ask when we talk about quality of life, is this joint pain affecting your ability to sleep? Okay, does it keep you from doing the things you want to do? Doesn't do any good to not do anything and sit around and not do the activities you enjoy in order to not suffer from the pain. Are you less active because of the joint pain? And is the pain affecting your ability to ambulate hills, stairs, things of that nature? When we get to that point, okay, we at that point contemplate and begin the discussion of total joint replacement. So really, who is a candidate for joint replacement? For my entire career, I've used three criteria. Number one, the presence of arthritis on x-ray, and typically those who have worst arthritis on x-ray are going to have more symptoms. Number two, the failure of a non-operative treatment plan that includes the things I've discussed so far. And number three, significant quality of life limiting symptoms. You know, this hip replacement, knee replacement are great operations as we'll talk about, but they are large operations and there's surgical risk with any operation, whether it be infection or bleeding or damage to structures, ongoing pain, etc. And so, you know, if a patient is doing well with medication and controlling the pain and quality of life is good, then I would recommend continuing that course. Um, but at a certain point, most patients with arthritis um, get to a point where they're ready to discuss surgery. And then the final thing is I'm reviewing uh, a patient to see, you know, are you a candidate for an elective total joint replacement? We talk about the concept of modifiable risk factors, which need to be optimized before surgery. A good example of that is diabetes. So if you are a diabetic, fact is you are at a higher risk for infection after a joint replacement. 
I can't change that, you can't change that. So we accept that risk. But the fact is, if you are a poorly controlled diabetic, which we typically define as a hemoglobin A1C greater than eight, then you are really at an unacceptable risk for infection after a joint replacement. So I can't modify the fact that you have diabetes, but we can as a team modify your control and uh, namely the hemoglobin A1C. The other thing that we run into not infrequently is body mass index. Body mass index is a measure of your height versus weight. And we know that there is a precipitous increased risk of infection after joint replacement with BMI above 40. So in alignment with expert recommendations in this country, uh, neither myself nor, nor, nor my two partners who do arthroplasty uh, in our practice will do an arthroplasty if BMI is above 40. That being said, there are certainly, certainly ways that we can help you um, get into the parameter that's needed for joint replacement. Namely, we have a wonderful relationship with a weight loss uh, clinic called Core Life that we've just established in the last six months or so, and that's worked very well for us. <clears throat> So let's talk about hip replacement first. So this is a typical hip replacement that's kind of blown up, but you can see that there are metal components. Uh, there's a metal component that goes into your, into your femur or thigh bone, and there's a metal socket component that goes into your socket. These are made of titanium. And then in between, you know, we've gone through, through the years and decades, there have been a variety of implant um, bearing surfaces that we've used, um, but really this is what has stood the test of time a plastic, and we call that plastic highly cross-linked polyethylene, mated with a ceramic ball. And uh, that really in 2021 is the Cadillac for hip replacement bearings and what I use on 100% of my hip replacements. So in the body, the hip replacement looks like this. If you remember that earlier cartoon with the head of the femur that had damage, we removed that surgically with a saw and placed the implant so that that ceramic and plastic coupling, if you will, becomes the new hip joint. And this is what that would look like. On the left, we see an x-ray where there is severe arthritis in the joint. Again, there's loss of joint space. And on the right, we see a hip replacement in place that has uh, essentially become an artificial articulation for that joint. In the knee, the human knee, the reason I show this cartoon, there are a lot of different structures in the knee, but unlike the hip, we think of the knee in three compartments. There's the inner compartment of the knee, the outer compartment, and then the compartment beneath the kneecap. And that's important because if we think of the knee in three compartments, we have options. We can do a total knee replacement, which is replacing the entire knee. But unlike the hip, we can actually contemplate surgeries that will replace a part of the knee. Uh, we call those uh, procedures unicompartmental arthroplasties, or uni for short. And so this slide, on the right-hand side, we see a total knee replacement that replaces the entire knee surface. On the left, however, we see a couple of options of partial knee replacements. And there are advantages and disadvantages of partial and total. When I am looking at a patient with knee arthritis who is a surgical candidate, I will always look at that knee critically and assess in my mind if I think they are a candidate for a partial. And if I do, we will have that discussion of pros and cons. And the way that I do my practice is the patient ultimately gets to choose. If I think you're a candidate for either, we'll have the discussion, talk about pros and cons, and ultimately uh, the patient gets a, a strong vote in uh, what is best for their situation. And so here in this cartoon, we see four different knees with four different situations. <clears throat> sort of the red, purple color is the arthritis. And you see on the left knee, the arthritis is on the inner part of the knee. On the second one from the left, it's on the outer part. In the third one from the left, it's up in the front of the knee, in the kneecap. And then in the final cartoon, uh, there is sort of more widespread arthritis. So each one of these knees may be suitable for a different implant, different situation. So here is uh, some x-rays. On the left-hand side, we see an example of a partial knee replacement. The inner part of the knee is replaced with metal and plastic components, but a good majority of the knee is left um, unresurfaced because the cartilage is good in that compartment. Whereas on the right side of the x-ray, we see a total knee replacement. This is a uh, knee replacement that replaces all of the surfaces of the knee. So let's talk about technology and total joint replacement. This is probably, to me, the most exciting thing that I like to talk about in this talk. So we've been doing joint replacement for, as a country and society, probably well over 50 years at this point. I've personally done joint replacement since, 
graduating residency in 2006, so coming up on 15 years. Um, and to me, this is the most exciting or what I call transformational technology that we've seen. This is the MAKO. So the MAKO is a robotic arm assisted technology for hip replacement, knee replacement, and partial knee replacement. So any operation that I do, I can use the MAKO robot. Um, like I said, we can use it for a partial knee replacement, a total knee replacement, or a total hip replacement. And basically, what does the MAKO do? The MAKO is a tool, and the premise of the MAKO is quite simple. Robots are more precise than humans. So the old way to do a knee replacement was to use mechanical tools and jigs, much like a carpenter would use to make predetermined angled cuts. And most of the time, those cuts are pretty accurate. But when we talk about robotic precision, the first thing we're able to do is get a CAT scan of your hip or knee, and we feed that information to the robot. So the robot understands your anatomy within a tenth of a millimeter, okay? And then on the time, so that's the planning part that you see on the left. That's the enhanced planning is the uh, CAT scan is obtained. That information is then fed by a human into the MAKO, and the implants are sized based on appropriate size and fit, and we can adjust those virtually on the computer. Then on the day of surgery, once we're actually doing the surgery, it's not just about the bony anatomy, it's about the soft tissue tension. So as I am doing the surgery, we can assess the soft tissue tension, and that plan we made with the MAKO can be adjusted based on the soft tissue tension. And that's kind of the key thing that I think the robot is very, very helpful for. And then the final part is it's all good if we have a nice plan, but human beings are inherently inaccurate. So if I'm cutting the bone with a saw, I might be one or two millimeters off with my cut. Well, what's different about the MAKO is the robotic arm controlled by me. So you can see that gun-like device. It's got a trigger. So that trigger is in my hand. And that robot is going to very precisely cut the bone that we're supposed to cut and only the bone. It will not let me deviate from the plan. So we're able to plan the joint replacement, adjust the joint replacement as needed during the procedure, and then execute what we planned with robotic precision. So MAKO Total Knee is probably the most widespread and, in my opinion, useful indication for the MAKO. Here is a very telling chart. So in the United States, in the United States, one in five patients who undergo total knee replacement, 20% are not satisfied with the outcome of their knee replacement. So if you ask 100 patients on the street, so you've had a knee replacement, are you happy? 80% are going to say, yes, absolutely. The remaining 15% will say, yeah, it's good, but it's not exactly what I hoped for or whatever. Uh, still got some pain there. And then the remaining 5% are going to say, I, I just don't like this thing. I kind of wish I hadn't have done this. And across many studies through many decades, this result has been the same. And this is where I think the MAKO can help improve this number. So here's an example of a MAKO total knee. So I walk into the operating room. And this has already been planned. I know, if you look to the right of the screen, that for this patient, we're going to need a size 4 femur, and the sizes are 1 to 8. We're going to need a size 5 tibia, and we're going to use a 9 millimeter thick plastic or polyethylene. So this is the plan we have walking in. Once I move the knee, so this is a cartoon of the knee, so I'm actually moving the knee, and we're getting numbers. And if you look in the lower right corner there, our goal number is 18 millimeters. You can see that none of those numbers is 18 millimeters. So in the old way of doing these, I would have to sort of adjust things by hand. And this is where a human's inaccuracy comes in. With the MAKO, I can then alter the implants virtually before we ever touch your bone. So I get something that looks more like this. And in this case, our goal was 19 millimeters. Boy, we're within a millimeter all around of that number. So this is what we call a well-balanced knee. So if we execute this plan, we should have very, very good ligament balance, which in turn, we think, should lead to a knee that lasts a long time and is pain-free for the patient. So it is my hope and the hope of many other thousands of orthopedic surgeons who in the last five years or so since this technology has come on have really gotten on board with this. It is our hope collectively that this technology is going to change, is going to move that needle on the 20% of knee replacement patients who are unhappy. And thus far, again, the data is very early. Any scientist worth their salt 
is going to say, show me 10 to 15 year results. And I acknowledge that. But in the early going, there are over 50 peer reviewed clinical publications and well over 350 more. So what this means is that people are using the MAKO, getting good results from it, and writing about that. And so I think in the next five or 10 years, this is the information that we have available is going to tell us that the MAKO gives superior results. And now let's talk about MAKO total hip. Excuse me while I just get a sip here. So this is an x-ray of a total hip replacement. And just kind of train your eyes to what you see there. You see a stem in the thigh bone, you see a socket in the socket, and you see a metal ball or ceramic probably. So this I will tell you as an orthopedic surgeon, this is a good looking hip, okay? This hip, the components are placed correctly. And we know that if the components are placed correctly, the patient is going to do well. What has gotten a lot of attention in the last five years, more than it probably deserves in my opinion, is you know which way do you do the hip? Do you do it from the front approach, the side approach, the back approach? The studies have consistently shown that the approach used to perform a hip replacement does not alter the outcome of that surgery. There have been many, many studies. Um, but what does matter is putting the parts in correctly. So if this is how a hip ought to look, let me show you this x-ray. So this is a patient, um, and I took this from the internet. This is not a case that's known to me. But if you look at the metal sockets in this patient, I think a good way to describe them is cattywampus, okay? If you look at the position of these two sockets, they do not look like this, okay? That's how the socket ought to look. What this, this x-ray is demonstrating, we're looking for a 45 degree angle when we put the socket in. On the one side, on the what is the left side, or to your view, the right side, the socket's at 68 degrees. And on the other side, the socket's at two degrees or minus two degrees. So this is what we call implant malposition. And trust me when I tell you, this happens more frequently than any of us would like to admit. Now the patient may feel fine. Uh, because the arthritis has been eliminated from the hip joint, the patient is going to experience pain relief. But unfortunately, unbeknownst to the patient, these joints, because the implants are malpositioned, are not going to wear correctly like this joint is. So the plastic that should last 15, 20 years or longer is going to wear out prematurely because it's not seeing the correct forces because of the implants being put in incorrectly. So this has been extensively studied. This is a little bit of an old study, but this is an interesting concept. So these authors, and I will tell you that some of these authors Dr. Barrick, Dr. Clavisi are world-renowned joint replacement surgeons. They looked at their own patients and they looked at, okay, here's where we want to put the socket. How often did we get it within an acceptable range? And in this study, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've actually looked at the study, I believe their overall accuracy for putting the parts where they wanted them was 75%. So that's pretty good. But the way I kind of tell patients is if I gave you a free vacation, and I said, look, I'm going to give you a free, all-expense-paid trip to the Bahamas, just one catch. The plane that you're getting on, it has a 75% chance of landing. Well, would you take those tickets? Probably not, because 25% is not a great uh, downside. Uh, we'd like to be more accurate than 75%. And so this is where I think the MAKO hip helps me. Now, for full disclosure, I don't use the MAKO hip for every case. In very straightforward cases, I feel with my experience and the way I've been doing things for a long time, we can get it right every time. But if there's any concern, maybe the anatomy is off, maybe the patient's very large, it's gonna be difficult to see in there because I do a tissue sparing surgery. We don't make the big extensile incisions like we used to. In those cases, I think that the MAKO is very helpful. So here, again, is a MAKO total hip replacement this information has been fed into the computer from a CAT scan. <clears throat> so before I ever walk in the room or start surgery in the patient, I have this model to look for, uh, to look at rather. We know what we're doing, what, what length adjustments we're making, what size our components are gonna be, and this is actually a prediction of what the x-ray will look when the surgery is done. And again, during surgery, I have very precise information about the patient's anatomy and can plan my surgery with far more precision than I uh, ever was able to without it. So when it's all said and done, this is a study that looked at robot hip versus non-robot hip. So the two 
graphs that you see. On the left-hand side, every dot represents a surgery. The gray zone box is where the surgeon intended to put the socket. On the left is non-robot, on the right is robot. So you can see that essentially 100% of the dots on the right-handed graph are within the gray box, meaning that the MAKO, regardless of any other variance that may fool a surgeon, um, is gonna put that socket where we want it every time, okay? So um, that's the end of the presentation in terms of the arthritis uh, talk and the robot. Happen to answer any questions about that, but now I just wanna talk a little bit about the um, hospital that I am very privileged to work at, and that's Clemens Medical Center, uh, obviously in Clemens, uh, Clemens, North Carolina. So the Clemens Medical Center opened in 2013, and it was my understanding that initially it was just going to be opened as an ambulatory surgery center. But <clears throat> given the demands of the, um, of the area and the need for more robust joint replacement centers, uh, it actually was expanded into a full-fledged hospital in 2017. So Clemens Medical Center has 36 beds. Uh, there is a full host of services to include a full surgery suite, rehabilitation, laboratory services, and a blood bank. There's a pharmacy and infusion center, x-ray, CT scan, and MRI. <clears throat> In addition, there's an emergency department. Um, and so this is a very robust hospital. And on the same campus, the building I'm talking to you from is my office, which is across the driveway from the hospital. We actually have an ambulatory surgery center above us, but I do my joint replacements at Clemens Medical Center. And the thing about this little hospital, I call it the little hospital that could, uh, there are over 1,600 joint replacements performed annually. And at this point in time, I'm confident that that number is much higher. Uh, Clemens Medical Center persistently has a press gaining, which is a satisfaction rate higher than 90%, which is very unusual for any hospital. We have exceedingly low infection rates, readmission rates, and mortality rates. So our data and the care you get at our hospital at Clemens Medical Center is on par with any other joint replacement uh, center. We actually have Joint Commission um, Center of Excellence uh, accreditation. We are actually um, in the zone to renew that this year. Um, and so here is an example of an inpatient uh, score, 91.5% uh, likelihood of recommending this hospital to others. That's a great number for, a, for an inpatient hospital. So here's a little bit about the process. So in the days before surgery, you know, when we meet and we make a decision in our spectrum of care that we're going to do a joint replacement, um, that sort of sets off a process. So my scheduler will schedule the surgery with you at a date that's convenient for you. And it's all about sort of making sure that your life is arranged so you can get your joint replacement and have success. This is an elective operation. There's never any urgency to it. We want you to schedule the joint replacement at a time where you're going to have the help, you can get time off from work, etc. Once we have that surgery scheduled, we have a very robust preoperative process. It's called the PAB. And in that process, you're going to see a medical and anesthesia expert. They're going to do a full examination. Now, I've already sort of screened your health at my, uh, at my visit. For instance, if your hemoglobin A1C is too high or BMI, those issues have to be corrected before we schedule your surgery. Once we schedule your surgery, you see the folks at the surgical wellness clinic. They do a full medical assessment, laboratory studies, et cetera. Make sure that you are safe to undergo the surgery. If at any point any concerns are raised, we stop, we get that issue addressed. Let's say you need a cardiology consultation for something and we make sure that you're safe to proceed. And then on the day of surgery, you come in, you get a thorough review and assessment of all of your um, medical needs again and we get ready for surgery. So the black line in the middle there is sort of uh, when we start the surgery, before surgery, you see me, any final questions are answered. Uh, and I forgot to mention that three or four, five, three to five days before the surgery, you'll see my physician assistant, Ben, who is excellent at answering any final questions you may have. Um, so we wanna make sure you go into surgery with no unanswered questions. Um, and then we do your surgery, you go to the recovery room after that, 95% of my patients go home on day one, certainly not because we're pushing them out the door, we're not a hotel, but at the same time, because we have aggressive physical therapy, multimodal pain management with a variety of different non-narcotic and narcotic medications, advanced anesthesia techniques, and uh, excellent nursing care, our patients for the most part are ready to go home one day after surgery and do very well with that. So this is sort of um, what we call patient-centered care. 
So you see that there are a variety of services, anesthesia, the pre op process we talked about, the pharmacy, the nurses, nutrition, uh, case management, food and nutrition, making sure that the food's good. The food actually is good at Columbus Medical Center. And you see that are all of these things, you're in the middle. So this is what we call patient-centered care. You are the center of the universe. It's not about me. It's not about the nurses. It's about giving you the care you need. And we are all cogs in the wheel, if you will, to uh, provide that care. And then finally, you'll hear a term called ERAS, which is something that is being done nationwide in joint replacement centers. But, you know, our goal is to enhance the recovery and have patients recover quicker. And it's multimodal. It starts with the education that you get at the preoperative visit, uh, nutrition. So gone are the days where you have to eat or drink nothing after midnight. You're starving by the time you get to your surgery. We actually allow you to have a carbohydrate drink, uh, which helps hydrate you and also, um, you know, more satisfaction since you're not starving. Uh, as I said, multimodal pain medication to include Tylenol, anti-inflammatory medication, and narcotics. From an anesthesia standpoint, the vast majority of the joint replacements that we do are under spinal anesthetics. So we put a needle in your back, deliver medicine that make, makes your legs go numb, and then give you some propofol to make you go to sleep. But all the while, you are sleeping and breathing on your own. We no longer, unless exceptional circumstances or patient choice, we tend not to do general anesthetics and knock you out with a breathing tube and have an iron lung breathe for you. Um, we have found that general anesthetics typically have more nausea, um, more um, adverse effects after the anesthetic, et cetera. So our preference is spinal anesthesia. Nutrition is very important before and after the surgery. And of course, early physical therapy and rehabilitation. So these are sort of the tenets of the enhanced recovery after surgery protocols. So we have found that enhanced recovery after surgery leads to fewer complications, reduces length of stay in the hospital safely, and improves patient experience. So in summary, thank you again for joining me during your lunch hour. We've reviewed some of the non-operative and operative options available to the hip and knee arthritis patient. We've reviewed some of the exciting new and what I believe is transformational technology that can assist the surgeon in improving outcomes and joint replacement. And we've talked about Novant Clements Medical Center, which is a high volume joint replacement center, which delivers a remarkable patient-centered uh, care experience. So that is my presentation. At this point in time, we have plenty of time uh, for any questions any of y'all may have. Um, Larry is asking who makes the knee replacement part? And he says, go Navy. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so as far as knee replacements, I, I kind of put it in terms of um, trucks. I just bought a pickup truck. I live in North Carolina now. I'm a Dodge guy. So the next guy might be a Chevy guy, a GMC guy, a Ford guy. That's fine. Everyone has their preferences and their reasons why, but we're going to assume that each of these vehicles is made with appropriate quality manufacturing processes in place, etc. So it's a preference thing. I use Stryker products. Stryker is one of the largest, if not the largest, manufacturers of products. Um, so there is Stryker, Depew, Zimmer, and Smith and & Nephew are the large manufacturers of implants. The knee that I use, I absolutely hate the name of it. It's called the Stryker Triathlon. And all of the companies do this. They try to market the implants with names that will get the patient to go, ooh, triathlon, that must mean that I can run on the knee. Well, in fact, running is just frowned upon very heavily after joint replacement because of the forces it puts on the implant. Uh, but nonetheless, the knee that I use has 17 years of clinical history and is among the um, you know, uh, most successful knees uh, in, in the history of knee replacement. There's only one that I'm aware of from Depew that has a longer track record. But importantly, what I want folks to hear is I use the implants I use because I believe in them and they work. I receive absolutely no financial kickback from any of the companies. Um, if I did, I would need to disclose that, but I do not. Okay, so to answer your question, I use the Stryker Triathlon Total Knee Arthroplasty System. And then for hips, I use Stryker components as well. Um, what are your thoughts, Dr. Craven, on walking on a treadmill after surgery? That's fine. So there is, um, when we talk about impact and exercise, there is low impact and high impact. Um, and the, interestingly, the definition of running, at, at a certain point when you're walking, one foot is always on the ground. And as you walk faster, one foot's always on the ground. What defines a run, okay, the transition from walk to run, at a certain point, both feet are gonna be off the ground at the same time. 
And when that happens, when a foot comes back down, that causes a high amount of stress through your joints. So low impact activity, where your foot never leaves the ground or you always have one foot on the ground, would include walking on a treadmill, elliptical, bicycle, swimming are all fine. And even high impact activity, if you, I promise you, if you go on the internet and go to, you know, mytotalknee.com or some crazy site like that, you're going to get on these blogs and see patients who say, I don't know what they were talking about. I've run five marathons on my knee and it's done fine. We don't really have any scientific data that tells you not to run, but what I tell patients is there's really no scientific data that tells me if I jump out of a plane with a parachute, I'll probably have a better chance of saving my life. Um, and so the point there is that sometimes we have to just use common sense. And based on all of the benchtop um, analyses that the companies have done on these implants, high impact uh, force is going to lead to an earlier detriment of the joint. So to answer your question, which I was very long-winded at, walking on a treadmill after joint replacement I think is just fine. Um, Dr. Craven, following the hip replacement surgery, you said a patient can go home one day later. What about rehab? How long does it actually take to recover from the surgery and be able to move about normally without a cane or walker? Yep, everybody varies, uh, but generally speaking, if we're looking at hips and knees, hips recover much, much quicker. It is not unusual for me to see a patient after a hip replacement two weeks in the office with no cane, no crutches, anything. That being said, we have to understand that the implants, the metals are still growing into the bone and that process takes about six or eight weeks. The tissues are still healing. So in my former life in San Diego, everyone loves to surf. I would let you on a surfboard at eight weeks. The understanding though is with hip or knee replacement, at about eight weeks, you're gonna be 80, 90% recovered. The subtle continuance of recovery, the, the achy pain, the small little things can take up to a year uh, to fully recover. Um, and as far as therapy after hip replacements, we do it. I send patients to therapy. There was actually a very well done study a few years ago that was presented at a renowned orthopedic meeting that showed that patients who did or did not have therapy after hip replacement surgery did the same. So for knee replacements, it's not negotiable. Patients need therapy after knee replacement, but hip replacements tend to recover much more quickly. And frankly, in some patients, therapy may not even uh, be necessary. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we know it's a gorgeous day um, out, and so we just appreciate um, your time today. And um, if you have any questions um, in the chat, I have placed our office phone number for those of you who stated you would like a consultation with Dr. Craven, as well as our location. Um, we would be happy um, to get you scheduled with him. Again, thank you so much for your time. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone.